morning. Thank you for coming to our talk today. Now, I'm Mohamed Tagesi, I'm from Cairo, and I'm going to tell you about the work that we're doing in Cairo. Now, first of all, to set some context, transportation is a problem in Cairo. It's not that easy to travel through the city. The way that we want to approach this is we want to understand what it is, what happens. So, we started looking for all available information on public transportation within the city. And this is really what we get. This is the most recent information that the Cairo Traffic Authority publishes. That's equivalent to Transport for London or the Big Hockey here in Berlin. And it's a PDF with 20 pages. Let me walk you through a little bit of how it actually looks like. So I took it and I did my work on it and I put it in CSV. And this is what you get. Now, I think that this was a little bit of a problem we have with working with government data in Egypt. You really have it lucky here in Europe. If you look at the very left side, you will find that we have seven bus routes that are numbered number one. <laughs> and you will notice that the difference between them is actually what is in the second column, the name of the symbol. There is number one dash, there is number one space, number one not like an air, number one space dash, which is different from number one dash. <laughs> <laughs> and what is the route? It's all right, forget me for that. But you'll find that all of these are basically the same start and end, and just different things in the middle. Now, each word of these, or each collection of words between the dashes, is actually not a station or a stop. No, this is an area in Cairo. So if we were in Berlin, this would basically would say Moabit, uh, Kreuzberg, Neukölln. And that's it, but you're lucky about where you're gonna start in Neukölln, if it's gonna be in the north, in the south, it's up to you. <laughs> and then you'll find this entire confusion across 853 roads, that don't really correspond to 853 routes. I do not know how many public bus routes operate in the city by a single public authority responsible. Assumptions go from 400 to 800. I've been working on this for the last 10 minutes. <laughs> Let me show you another piece of information. Uh, oh, one last bit. This is actually the only public information that's available, and it's the most recent one. It's from April 2010. So we also have a problem with time limits. Going to more recent information, this is from 2015, this is not public, but this is a list of all the licensed microbuses. So to put it into context, we have a metro, we have the CTA, Cairo Traffic Authority, operating public buses. We have regulated microbuses, and these are the ones that are actually licensed. And then we have a whole lot of other unregulated, unlicensed ones. And you find that we have 19,500 these unregulated microbuses operating. So this is really the scale of the system. As a user in the street, that's the kind of information that you see, if you get to find it. This is an Ataba. Ataba is one of the most central stations in central Cairo. It would be equivalent to Hauptbahnhof here in Berlin, or to um, King's Cross in London. And these are the public bus lines that start with it. So you see that we really have a problem with information. So, what do we do? We are a team, we're called Transport for Cairo, and this is half of our team with a couple of attendees at an event that we threw this March in Cairo. This was actually open data day, we are the ones who organized it, because what we try to do is gather information on all of this public transportation system in Cairo and release it as open data to be able to start working on top of it. So now I will guide you on the process that we do and the troubles that we face. This is the OSM base map for Cairo. To give you a very simple orientation, the space in the middle that goes is basically the Nile, and you have the right side which is Cairo, and the left side which is Giza, greater Cairo area, 20 million people. The first problem that we face is that the base map itself is very, very bad. Now, yeah, it looks good and it covers all the streets, that's true, but the metadata of it is bad. In the sense of most of these roads are designated as highways where people are not allowed to move on it. So when you open Google Maps and you try to have a routing or something, you can't really walk in Cairo because ah, highway, it's dangerous, you can't move. And this does not correspond to reality. So this is the first problem. The input data that we have from all of them is already not very realistic. What we do is then we try to write each bus from the very beginning to the very end and map it using mobile technology. This is line 1044, which I took as an example for today. 
and it starts from here in the south, from the Neve, all the way up to the airport. This, uh, these are 37 kilometers, and we just tried it from the beginning to that. Third station we do is that we actually try to map it, we map how much time it takes, we map where it stops. And the way that it works in Cairo is that you can act out the driver wherever you want, I want to stop, and he stops. And we don't really have bus stops in Cairo, not in the entire city, so that's the system. We map that, and we actually find a lot of stops that exist that are permanent, and a lot of them that are impermanent. So in the next step, we overlay the suggested stops that we have, which do not directly correspond to the ones that we actually mapped on the ground. Why? Um, you will find that here we have to what, two times where the bus actually stopped within 50 meters of each other. So we just assume, yeah, we have only one stop here. You find other times where it didn't stop at all. So we see, is there a reason to stop or not? All of the structures, the highway, so it only stops one time in the middle, in the middle of the highway for a certain reason, but still, this is the only stop that we actually consider. So we need to work between assumptions and between the reality because we can't really fit reality within the assumptions. The final step is to make it legible and to make it actually usable for people. So we designed these beautiful looking maps, we name these stations because they actually don't have real names. And then we put it in a database to make it machine readable. So this is the schema that we made for illustration purposes of GTFS. GTFS is General Transit Feed System. Previously, Google Transit Feed System. Started in 2005. By 2010, it had developed as the standard worldwide. Everybody uses it. And it was only in 2014 that a project called Digital Matatos in Nairobi tried to implement that standard on a third world standard, on an informal transportation system such as ours, that's not as regulated and as well organized as here in Europe. So, you get all sorts of data in it, and then you can represent it in a trip routing application. This is how Google Maps would work if we had data in Cairo. It would give you the name of the stops, it would give you the name of the bus that you have to take, or the metro line, the time it takes to move between the stops, how much you need to work, and everything. So that's really our end result that we want to get there. But now let's get to the really interesting part. Can we really apply GTFS, the CSV file, on Cairo? Okay. Well, the first question is really, what is a stop? So, let's take a look at this picture. This is actually me being irresponsible because I'm driving my car and I'm holding the camera. <laughs> because I am in the middle of a highway driving at 90 kilometers, and these are people standing in the middle of a highway that connects Cairo to Shinzeit. And this is the public bus that stopped for these people that are standing there every day to pick them up in the middle of the highway. Because this highway intersects with another road and they are not connected. And the people from the other road get on top of the highway by a, by a set of ladders that they built themselves to use the public bus to reach their workplace and education and healthcare. So I am convinced of a stop. Do I put a stop on the middle of a highway or not? In this case, we actually decided to, because it's a permanent stop and because people rely on it, and because if you want to reach from that particular area, Cairo or Shinsei City, this is your gateway. Let's take another one. This is in the middle of Cairo. This is an Egyptian citizen, and he is waiting for a bus. This is a bus stop, and this is as permanent as a bus stop as it gets, I promise you. Go to that bus stop, and within one minute, a bus will come and pick you up. It really works. And you see that there is no sign or there is no <coughs> indication or it's just a normal turn. But in real life use, it has turned to a bus stop and it's very reliable. If I go to ask somebody, where do I take a bus to go to Giza, they're going to point me to there. So again, this is a permanent stop. But then I have to make a distinction between other stops that are not really permanent. And I need to distinguish between those and actual bus stops which have signs. This is the kind of work that we do. And it breaks the assumptions, what is a stop? But let's go to another one, what is even a route? Remember when I told you we have 6,000 public buses? 15,000 registered microbuses? 
Well, these are part of the third line. These are part of the estimated 40 to 80,000 microbuses that we have that are unlicensed and unregulated. These are downright illegal because they are licensed here as a private vehicle, but they are a public bus system, basically. They are a very big part of the system nowadays. These are in Atala, which is the main station that I mentioned earlier, right in the middle of Cairo, right next to the Atala police station. So you see that the legal and the illegal has intermingled in Egypt, but to form a system. And these are actually sometimes very permanent lines. This is an Azhar. Azhar is like the bazaar and you know, old Islamic Cairo. And it connects it with Atala. And you go there, you stand, and within a minute, one of these small ones, like here you see that there are two fighting with the same customer, will come and stop and take you. So this is as permanent a system as it gets. It's as reliable as taking an underground. It's always going to be there. But it's illegal, and it's unregulated, and it has no number, and it's informal. So again, we need to distinguish between those and the ones that don't exist. Then you find all the particular stories that are associated. Remember the highway I showed you earlier, the one connecting Cairo to Sheikh Zayed? Well, the other road below is actually a rural road. And people reach these highways by taking these cars, which are called Box al Fayyum. They are called Box because this is actually a truck, and they just did the box in the hand and people want to sit inside. And on the real turns, only people from Fayyum are allowed to drive these buses. There is no legal law separating that, or there is, it's just the way it is, it's just the custom of it. And all these cars are licensed from Fayyum, but they drive in particular parts in rural Cairo. So you find that it's actually an anthropological study as well of what we are doing to understand why the system works the way it is. This is another difference between us and Germany, for instance. It's not very visible, but if you look, you will find that there are all sorts of stuff written here, all sorts of stickers put on a brand new bus that's maybe three months old and public. And the ones who put those are actually the drivers themselves. And they're not like people going at night and spraying graffiti and hoping not to get caught. Why? Because the, this is actually a reality in Egypt that drivers have a lot of leeway over how the bus system runs, and the authorities are not really they don't really organize it as well as they should do. They don't really put out information, like we saw earlier. And route engines, if there is a problem with the bus, if there is a service interruption, it falls down to the drivers to communicate this and to deal with this. And then you find all sorts of interesting things that are completely break away with any system. Again, try to take a close look. You have a bus, you have two passengers sitting, and you don't have a driver sitting in the front. Why is this so? Well, uh, I am Muslim. This was during Friday prayers. And the way that we pray on Friday is that we go to the mosque, we listen to a speech for 20 minutes, and then we pray for five minutes. So that was during the speech, and I find the bus coming and parking, and the driver coming to listen to the speech, and to fulfill his religious duty. During the time that this bus parked there, which was about 20 minutes, two other buses of the same line passed, and just continued. And then you will find that this is something that you can't really put in any system. And this is in the official system. Never mind the similarities that happen in the unofficial system. But is it all bad? No, really, because this unofficial, this informality actually also solves a lot of problems. And that's also what we find in part of our research. This is a microbus, and this one has the orange head license plate, so it's licensed. But this is not operating as a microbus in that particular instance. It's operating as a school bus. Look inside and you'll find a lot of young girls wearing a white headscarf and going to Ganaab and also school at 8 in the morning. This bus goes every day to meet Hoppa, which is a poor neighborhood in Cairo, picks these girls and drives them all the five kilometers to their school. And it solves a very real community problem. How do I get my children safe, on time, and affordable to school? In a system that works, but has a lot of problems. And then you'll find that the informality is the thing that actually comes to help people out and to solve their problems. So this is the presentation I wanted to give. Feel free to contact me for any questions. And I actually wanted to leave the last 10 minutes of time for questions that you have. Thank you.
plus 10. Is it uh, deterministically always taking the same route, or does it have some variations of that? And that is a very good question. Um, okay. I assume with the public bus routes that most of the times they take the same bus route because they are public and they are bound by a schedule. But then again, I find a very real problem. We, had, uh, we have a database from the web bank that gives us all the paper maps in GIS form for the public bus routes. We are collaborating with the web bank, in fact. And then we found that these paper maps that are as recent as February 2015 have not accounted for particular roads in Cairo that have been closed since 2011. So you find that you have data that is official that cannot be true. Of course, they are going to change. And the same applies to the microbuses. If we go to this set of microbuses, this um, list, sorry, this list over here, all of these routes are very deterministic. They say up to the level of the street that you have to take. But then you find in reality that you have muscle and these microbuses who are completely informal and where the driver can wake up in the morning and just decide if he is going to operate or not and on which route they are going to operate. And you find that this is a very flexible system because they never drive empty. They always return the station until they fill up. If they can't fill up, they will just go and find a different route to operate on. So it's actually a very efficient system in terms of load factor. You will never find in Egypt what you find here in Europe, which is a public bus system operating through the empty. So you see it's a variation. Sometimes they're deterministic, sometimes they're most of the time deterministic, and sometimes they're completely flexible. And this is everything that we do, it's always a race. Sometimes the stop is always there, sometimes it has a physical structure, sometimes not. Sometimes it operates sometimes. Uh, do you collect data on uh, basically taxis? Because it seems like there's a gray area between public transport and private transport. Uh, that's You have a lot of gray <laughs> compared to the systems that I'm used to. And so um, are there like, for these things, for example, um, do they go off route if someone like knows their number and they call these microbuses? Will they go and do like private trips? Do they, are they acting as taxis or do you like draw a line at like basically on-demand pickup and only do things that have predetermined routes? Or is there a gray area there as well? It's a gray area because this is licensed as a private vehicle, so if you know the driver, you can call him and he will come and do whatever you want. And it's, it's completely up to the discussion of the driver to operate. You will find that <coughs> most of the ownership, some are part of a fleet where you have a fleet owner owning 60 vehicles and renting them out on day per day, and some belong to a government employee who takes it in the morning to his job. Somebody comes and picks it up, operates it for six hours, and then brings it back. So it's again, it's a huge spectrum. Uh, in international development parts, they are referred to as shared taxis. Um, so basically, this is, a, again, it's a spectrum. Yeah, one thing I'm really interested in is in my town of Portland, Oregon, um, they, the city tried to stand up to Uber and say, uh, at least provide uh, accessible transport for people that, for example, require a van that's equipped for wheelchair transport. Mm -hmm. And so they, um, but it was underspecified. And so a lot of people, when they started using it, had really high times to when they requested a wheelchair accessible Uber to when one actually showed up, in certain cases like nine hours. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd, I'd really be interested in, in potentially comparing this data um, with like mean trip time for people on like certain ends of the transport spectrum, because it, like you mentioned at the end, near the end of the talk, that it's not all bad. Like you have a variety of different options, and I'm uh, interested if you if you're comparing public and private in that way in terms of efficiency versus like regulation and things like that. Exactly. We're also comparing like the coverage of the public system versus the private system, and in the process we found that we can't just focus on the quantitative on the CSV side of it, but we also have to look at the qualitative side of it because these cars are not ready to take on uh, people with special needs, people with disabilities. But then again, you find that people with disabilities flock to these cars in particular because the drivers and the people sitting in the cars will find a way to uh, help them out. It's a much more communal experience. And this is only the stuff that you will find with qualitative research. Uh, you touched on a very interesting part that I also want to add on, which is the time element. Um, 
we don't have schedules for public buses in Cairo, and we definitely don't have schedules for those because they operate as they wish. So here what we do is we actually rely on interacting with like APIs on the internet to estimate traffic patterns. And then you find that for the same route, like for the one that I showed at the very beginning, 1044, the time can increase by up to 60% over the course of a day, over normal circumstances, due to traffic. And again, when you have this kind of variation, forget about holding a schedule that you can respect or encode in software. So again, you're faced with a problem. How do I compile my reality with the data standard that has been developed, standardized, and is used all over the place now? Do you have any other questions? How do you plan? To yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, how do you plan to proceed? To, like, do you think you'll ever manage to, to compile this, this uh, case down to GTFS? Yes. Okay. That's uh, yeah. <laughs> how do you plan? The first thing we need to do is we need to collect as much data as possible in a short time frame, because I'm basically taking a picture of the picture of the city. And to do this, we're working actually on applying for an international grant with a couple of partners in Egypt. Like we've been collaborating with a lot of international development organizations uh, to be able to map the entire city at once. We mapped on our own, we mapped 14 bus lines and a couple of micro bus lines and the metro. And published the metro as open data already and it has been picked up by a couple of applications. But we are faced with up to 800 public bus lines and up to 1,000 micro bus lines, so we can't do that on our own. That's the first thing. The other thing is that we find it increasingly necessary to create our own tools. Because the tools that exist, and a lot of startups in Silicon Valley start with creating now tools to do this and to create GTFS, but they're not appropriate to our context. Because we don't have a single operator, because of all these assumptions that we need to encode. So we find that we need to work on new tools and hopefully exchange the specifications of GTFS or expand it. And that's possible, it's an open standard. Um, so it's basically these three parts. Getting the funding, find the things, creating new tools, and we're hopefully we'll open source the ones that we created so far sometime soon, and fixing the open standard or adapting the open standard to our needs. Uh, do you actually cooperate with any other cities? Like, do you have an exchange with other cities having the same problem anywhere in the world, or in Egypt as well? Yes. <laughs> so, there are four cities worldwide that have tried to do what we did, which is map an informal system and create a digital data set and GDFS around it. These are Dhaka, Nairobi, Mexico City, and Jakarta. Uh, we have, in addition to that, like there has been some efforts in Amen recently, and they released like a graphical map that's beautiful. It's called Mapping Amen. We have talked with them. There is an emerging effort in Beirut, so we have also conversed with them very, very recently. This is uh, to the Arab world. There has been more recent, even another effort in Mexico City by a civic innovation lab there. It was called Mapaton. We have also talked with Mapathon recently, and we might collaborate, hopefully we'll collaborate with them uh, on using tools and on furthering the development of the tools. Because we find that they have the exact same problems and the exact same set of issues. I want to stop here, so stop here, no stations, etc. All right, that's all the time we have. Thank you very much. Thank you.